Well, thank you very much for coming, everyone, and welcome to uh, the um, immigration detention update that myself and Eva are doing. My name is Greg O'Kelly. I'm a barrister at Garden Court. I specialise in uh, immigration, asylum, and human rights, civil liberties, um, especially with an emphasis on detention uh, and people doing bad things to migrants generally, but, but particularly detention. Um, I'm speaking today with uh, Eva Dur, who is one of our uh, tenants here. She specialises in all uh, areas of public and human rights law. And she's a particular focus on immigration asylum law and also on the Equality Act. So we are going to speak for, uh, we've got an hour. I think we might be slightly quicker than that. Um, but hopefully I'll leave a little bit of time for um, questions. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now and put on our um, PowerPoint. So what I wanted to do with this talk, I've been doing an immigration detention update for a long time. And one thing I've found is that uh, sometimes there's just too much information in it. I've been putting in too many cases and too many changes. So the idea here is, you know, what would you tell somebody who had uh, just come out of a cave and not having been around for a whole year about what's happened in immigration detention law in the past 12 months? And the, end, the aim of this talk basically um, is to cover that. If you have just come out of a cave, you've missed the past 12 months, I'd advise you to Google Liz Truss and Prime Minister and you won't be disappointed. So things I'm going to cover in this uh, are top 10, top five immigration detention cases in 2022, based on importance, not on whether or not I like the results. Top five issues going on in 2022. What have we been looking at? Uh, what's important that's been happening? Some smaller issues, um, so some smaller cases, quantum, and what's coming up in the future. And uh, Eve is going to cover uh, some, of the, some of the bite-sized cases, and she's also going to give a general quantum update and look again at some principles in quantum as a helpful, hopefully, uh, reminder of those principles. So top five cases. Um, first of all, Katie, some of you will remember uh, Katie from the previous year in the admin court. This is what Katie did next. This is Katie in the Court of Appeal. And it's an important, uh, an important case. The appellant challenged the decision to impose conditional bail on them pursuant to the Schedule 10 to the 2016 Act to fight the fact that he could not be lawfully removed, relying on B Algeria. And some of you will remember that there's been a long running principle that a person couldn't be admitted to bail in circumstances where they uh, couldn't lawfully be detained. You know, it's an ancient principle of habeas corpus, which the, uh, the government specifically uh, tried to legislate out of successfully, it appears, uh, with the 2014 Act. Um, sorry, the 2016 Act. And the case concerned the provisions in Section 61, which specifically operated to reverse the decision in B. Algeria, which uh, had succeeded in the Supreme Court, that was Steph's case. Um, and the, I dealt with the question of whether the provisions in Schedule 10 that it re replaced it were to be read in the same way um, as that, uh, as in that act. The court held that liable to detention had the same meaning uh, as in Kadir, uh, which is that he, the, the individual in question did not need to be lawfully detained in order for there to be a power to impose bail conditions on them. So despite the fact that this was somebody who could not lawfully be removed um, and therefore could not be lawfully detained, you could still uh, keep that person on bail. So, you know, it's worth noting, this is an important reference to Kadir as well. Kadir is a case Secretary of State loves to refer to um, as pointing out that, you know, the, the Kadir definition um, of liable detention to detention just means somebody who can lawfully be detained. It's important to distinguish between liable to detention and somebody who can be lawfully detained pursuant to the Hardial Singh um, principles. And the Hardial Singh principles came up in Katie as well. Uh, and it was an argument by a Lord of Inverse, for I think, for Bail for Immigration Detainees, and that there should be an equivalence to Hardy O. Singh uh, for bail conditions, so that if, if, for, for being admitted to bail. So if you are somebody who um, is being potentially on bail for a, a very long time, there should be something equivalent to the Hardy O. Singh provisions that would limit the length of the time for which you'd be subject to bail. Uh, and Lord Justice Singh and the court in general dismissed that um, idea on the basis that um, there's a fundamental distinction between somebody being detained and somebody being at liberty, which is on bail. And that's something like it was inappropriate to apply the Hardy Singh principles in that context. But one thing I think practitioners might want to think about um, is an argument that I've been thinking about in the context of electronic monitoring, which is that there is a distinction between somebody who is uh, between a condition of bail and bail itself. So it makes sense, I think, to say what the Court of Appeal said, which is that uh, there's no reason to have a statutory limitation on release because you're just released. You're, you're either in detention or you're not. And if you're not in detention, why would you have a kind of a statutory limitation on that? Uh, 
But I think there's an argument to be made that there should be some kind of Hardy Singh equivalent on onerous conditions of bail. So, for example, uh, electronic monitoring. And I do, I do think there's, there's a strong case to say that there should be some kind of common law limitation a la Hardy Singh, and that applies in those circumstances. Detention Act against the Lord Chancellor. Um, this is a case concerning the detained duty advice scheme. And it was argued that there's a high risk of interference with the right of access to justice because uh, some DDAS uh, providers, so people who've applied for the contracts on the DDAS and got them, were taking no or very few steps to provide legal advice to thousands of detainees. Immigration bail advice was not being provided uh, to detainees. And incompetent providers were being permitted to continue on the DDAS scheme. Um, the court rejected those arguments completely, um, and that was on the basis that uh, the monitoring scheme was not sufficiently inadequate to create a risk of a lack of access to the courts, and the extension of contracts wasn't tame side unlawful in the facts. And one of the things the court said there was that the scheme itself, so the scheme of providing um, uh, access to uh, legal aid in the way that it did, wasn't by its nature an impediment to the courts. On the other hand, the system of monitoring could in principle have been an impediment, uh, but it wasn't on the particular facts. SPM, also called the Women for uh, Refugee Women case. Um, this was a really interesting case. It was a challenge to the provision of access um, to legal aid or representation in Durham side. So Durham side opened in November, 2022, sorry, 2021, replacing Yarlswood as a main female IRC. So basically Yarlswood is quite big, 400-ish places. Um, not that many women were actually being uh, accommodated in it. The numbers tended to be relatively low. Um, but at the same time, um, the Home Office had lost the use of Morton Hall because it had gone back to the, um, to the Secretary of State for Justice for use in the prisons. So there was a kind of a gap in provision. So the idea was that Yarl's Wood could be used as a, um, a male detention centre, which is what it is now, uh, and women will be moved to German side, which used to be a secure training centre. So in theory, it's less oppressive and unpleasant than Yarl's Wood and potentially more suitable for um, uh, vulnerable women, which is uh, the idea. Although, of course, vulnerable people shouldn't be detained in the first place. There we are. So in July 2021, a tender was opened up for DDAS services, but there were insufficient compliant responses, i.e. the responses weren't any good uh, or weren't close enough uh, or the um, people weren't sufficiently qualified. So those already working in Yarrowswood were given a six-month contract and a second tender brought three firms in, which were based miles away. There were two advice surgeries a week um, and the default arrangement was by telephone, which means that almost all, uh, well, in practice, no face-to-face -face DDoS advice was actually being given. Uh, the court rejected the claims um, and said that the provision of legal advice via telephone or video conference instead of in person for a six-month period did not amount to a denial of effective access to justice in real world conditions. Now, a couple of interesting points about this case. Uh, one is that it took place in the immediate aftermath of um, the COVID changes, um, which is essentially that in the context of COVID um, and because of the epi epidemic, as a matter of fact, very few DDoS in-person visits to, to were actually happening at all. In fact, apart from Yarrow's Wood, in the period that had been looked at uh, for statistical purposes, there were no visits uh, to IRCs by DDoS providers. There was really interesting uh, evidence before the court in that case from Joe Wilding, who uh, used to be at these chambers and is now an academic, talking about how difficult it is to build up trust with clients without seeing them face to face. And I think everyone here will have experience of that. And also how difficult it is in the context, for example, of asylum appeals to get a hold of important documents uh, and to talk to people about documents when you're not actually dealing with them face to face. Juliet Cohn uh, for Medical Justice also go, gave really useful evidence about uh, how difficult it was for people to disclose past experiences of trafficking and abuse um, if they're not actually speaking to somebody face to face. But the court found there was no hindrance or impediment to accessing legal services. Um, and the, the point made by Mrs. Justice Lang was the quality and convenience of modern video conference facilities is very good and comparable to an in person meeting. Alternatively, the telephone was an adequate means of communication for most people though it might not be in the context uh, of very vulnerable people. So the court found no uh, breach of the PSED uh, and also that it wasn't discriminatory. Fourth case I wanted to look at is <clears throat> MA against Coventry City Council. Now, this is a uh, primarily, I suppose, um, um, community care case, but it really de deals with an important uh, issue, which is the detention of people 
who claim to be children, uh, so putative children, in uh, on the basis of short form age assessments, which is a thing concocted uh, in the intake unit. Uh, so that the challenge was the, to, to the guidance issued for those uh, assessments uh, and in respect of the Secretary of State's decision to treat them, uh, the individuals in question as adults. A couple of interesting points about this. One is that the claims had already been released at the time uh, that the, the claim actually made its way into court and the Secretary of State tried very hard to get the public law claim struck out. So if you look at Mrs Justice Lang's judgment on that, um, there's some quite helpful uh, comments about the circumstances in which a um, primarily publicly law, public law point can continue to be run even after uh, the primary um, public law remedy is no longer required. <clears throat> and of course, this is just another response to the small boats cases, which are um, putting significant pressure both on resources of local authorities and also on the Secretary of State's ability uh, to comply with basic human rights. So the rationale of this, uh, this the, the uh, shortened um, age assessment uh, pro forma well, the, the short form age assessment is that you only do it for people who are clearly adults. <clears throat> However, people, people who are clearly adults don't really get an age assessment in the first place. They get uh, they get refused an age assessment, certainly by the Secretary of State for the Home Department, on the basis that their uh, their appearance very significantly, very strongly suggests that their demeanor very strongly suggests that they are significantly over the age of eighteen. So the people who are getting these um, short form age assessments people who were not obviously adults, but were nevertheless being provided with uh, a shortened system which didn't have the basic protections that you get from the Merton uh, principles. So, uh, for example, there was no provision for appropriate adults or no, no minded to process, and people were, uh, is inappropriately exhausted. Court held that detention for the pro uh, purposes of an age assessment was within the parameters of or ordinary detention and so was lawful provided the assessment complied with the Merton guidelines. So if you're detaining somebody to assess their age as part of assessing whether or not they're going to be granted leave or what should happen with them, um, that is not in principle unlawful, provided that the assessment with Merton guidelines. In this case, the assessment didn't, and therefore the assessment was not lawful, and detention was unlawful uh, as a consequence. I would say that you, uh, this case needs to be read with the judgment of Mrs. Mr. Justice Swift in the um, against the London Borough uh, of Brent, um, which uh, reached a conclusion that was not uh, particularly helpful to claimants, I would say, on the facts and seeks to roll back some of the protections in Merton, um, or certainly reduce their force. Case number five, last case of my top five cases. Um, case is C3, and this is an interesting case because um, it deals with habeas corpus. There have been a couple of habeas corpus cases this year, even though in general they're fairly rare. And involved two British women who traveled to Syria to join ISIS, have been captured uh, and were being detained by the author authorities, the Autonomous Administration of North and East Syria, which prior to reading this case, I'd never heard of. And they sought a writ of habeas corpus. And the basis for that was that, not that the Secretary of State had captured them or had originally captured them and rendered them somewhere, the Secretary of State had never been involved in a capture or custody, but the AANS had indicated and said in terms that it would release them if the UK government made an official request together with arrangements for the repatriation. And the Home Office refused, well, the Home Office, the um, SSFCDA, I'm not going to try and say that. Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and whatever they've added on, um, uh, refused. And the reason they refused was because of uh, Terrorism, essentially, they refused because of the security considerations. Claimants sought habeas corpus. The Court of Appeals said that um, concerns about national security were irrelevant to habeas corpus in principle. Um, what mattered was whether or not the Secretary of State had um, control um, of, of their detention. Because if the Secretary of State either had them in detention or had them in their control, they should, under the principle of habeas corpus, have to bring them to the court and give an account as to why their detention was unlawful or was lawful. On the facts, uh, the court found that they didn't have control over their detention. The fact that AANES made that indication that they would be released um, to the Secretary of State did not mean that the Secretary of State could actually control their release. The Secretary of State wasn't in charge. So um, moving on to the top five issues. Uh, <clears throat> Hopefully it sounds okay. I've had a qu query about that. I'm doing my best to keep it um, at a reasonable volume. 
The first of the top five issues that we're going to have is uh, GPS monitoring. Uh, a lot of you will have seen cases on this. It's a huge issue. So from the 31st of August, 2021, everyone subject to deportation proceedings or a deport order who subject to immigration bail must be considered for electronic monitoring. Um, from the start of January, for the end of January, 2022, anyone already on bail had their circumstance reconsidered um, and was made subject to electronic monitoring unless an exception applies. The only exceptions as it stands are where it would breach convention rights and where it would not be practical to admit them to uh, bail with conditions of electronic monitoring. There is a policy, it's the immigration bail policy, and there are extremely tightly drawn indicators of where human rights might be breached. I think the policy is really problematic. Um, in particular, you see in, in respect of trafficking victims, it says that one of the factors that should be taken into account is where somebody has a conclusive grounds decision that they're a victim of trafficking. Now, if, you're, if, you've, got a, if you've got a reasonable grounds victim of trafficking, you are uh, and you're and you suffer trafficking. You are no less vulnerable than the per, a person with a conclusive grounds decision um, in respect of trafficking. And I think this mirrors the approach in the adults at risk policy, which focuses on evidence rather than on vulnerability. And the real problem here uh, is is vulnerability. The other point about trafficking victims, of course, is that what happens with the GPS monitoring system, which is that everybody in uh, in question has an electronic tag. Uh, it's monitored twenty four seven. Uh, they off a function and vibrate when they're not supposed to, which can be really stressful for people. But the, the essence of these, um, somebody who is subject to uh, electronic monitoring is being monitored all the time. Uh, and the essence of trafficking is that somebody is controlling your movements and controlling what you do. So I think it's really problematic that the policy doesn't properly provide for people who are uh, have reasonable grounds in respect, uh, uh, reasonable grounds decisions showing that they may be victims of trafficking, but are not having... Um, but are not being treated uh, uh, on that basis with the Home Office is waiting for more evidence. So I think the policy's application is challengeable um, in many cases. If you're looking at it, you want to look at the uh, implications for the Equality Act for people who, are, who have some kind of mental health disability um, and in respect of uh, uh, data protection issues as well. <clears throat> uh, the intention at the moment is for, for the Home Office to roll out the use of non-fitted devices, which we're told are smartwatches, and preliminary work on that is underway. I know there have been, there's a tendering process, um, I think, completed, but there are no policies on it at the moment. And that's something that Privacy International has been looking at very carefully. And if you do on this, I will say that it's really worth looking at the uh, PLP report from uh, the end of October this year, Every Move You Make, The Human Cost of GPS Tagging and Ration Bail. And one really interesting and important issue that arises in the context of this new system is that the Home Office specifically says that it will hold data um, on people's movements so as potentially to rebut um, somebody's article eight, uh, they say in theory support, but re realistically rebut a person's article eight claim uh, in the immigration tribunal. So it's an astonishing provision really that requires somebody to be monitored 24 seven and have their data potentially analyzed by the home office in order to uh, see if they can use it to under, undermine um, a human rights claim. <clears throat> On the facts, it's gonna be difficult to justify the deportation of um, uh, it's going to be difficult to justify the deportation, or it's, sorry, the, the subjection to a condition of electronic monitoring. We see that there continue to be serious issues and delays of bail accommodation. There have been delays caused by um, the policy requirement for a strategic director to consider release of um, SNPs. So any FNP who is getting to the end of their sentence can only be released if a strategic director approves it. So there continue to be big problems with delay, uh, bail accommodation. Um, and there are a number of different interlocking and separate issues. One is the policy requirement for strategic directors to consider release of FNPs. So you can't re release an FNP um, unless the strategic director approves it. So I've seen a number of cases where a caseworker thinks they can't remove someone quickly. Therefore, they um, decide they should, at least in principle, be released, but need accommodation. Um, they don't have accommodation sorted in time to to send it to the strategic director. And so the person ends up being detained in principle, uh, in, in theory at least, in order to obtain accommodation because once the decision to detain is made, um, any probation accommodation falls away. Uh, and you've, I've seen a number of cases where um, the fact that 
uh, a release referral wasn't ready, i.e. accommodation wasn't ready, has meant that somebody's been detained for the purposes of getting accommodation, which is, in my view, clearly unlawful. Um, and the Home Office accepted in the case I did with Jed at uh, Wilson's that that was unlawful and there was a public law error bearing on the decision to detain. We're also seeing extensive delays in the making and considering of um, uh, accommodation requests or applications and significant delays in the part of probation. Uh, you'll all be aware of the issue with the lack of accommodation stock at the moment, um, which is a real problem. Um, the Home Office is also refusing Section 4 requests on the basis that uh, immigration detention is adequate accommodation. That is, again, clearly unlawful and something you can challenge, may have to be challenged in the AST, depending on the facts. There's also a refusal to provide Schedule 10 accommodation on the basis of a lack of exceptional circumstances and no residence condition. Again, I've repeatedly challenged that successfully in the context of decisions that um, a person uh, should not be granted bail accommodation because they don't have a condition of residence, which I think is usually fettering of discretion because it will be the Secretary of State that's decided the conditions in the first place. So yes, so there are issues in respect of grace periods, the correct approach is that set out in the cases of America and AC Algeria. Manston is something you'd be aware of. The Manston short-term holding facility opened in February to conduct border security screening for small boats cases arriving in Kent. Widely uh, publicized problems there, uh, overcrowding, detention in excess of legal limits, um, also lack of adequate accommodation, food, access to telephones, lawyers, our interpreters. Um, there's a serious diphtheria outbreak resulting in at least one death. Detention action threatened a wide ranging legal action about that. Laura Dubinsky doing that case in Dr. Lewis. Bail for immigration detainees similarly got well into the pre-action protocol process. Also appears to have got the numbers under control, uh, but it remains to be seen whether that stays the case. In respect of Manston, um, it was previously an overflow Lurie Park and a coronavirus testing location during the Brexit transition period. Uh, and it's basically just a barracks. And what they did was they turned a bunch of um, marquees, large marquees into short term, into holding rooms under the short term holding facilities. So you're essentially talking about canvas accommodation. And really strikingly, um, David Neal, uh, the chief inspector, wrote, wrote a, uh, an excoriating report about this. And when he was asked in Parliament about the numbers, uh, he said that we had passed the point uh, where the place was completely and properly run. Second opinions. This is a really important new issue. Um, so the, there's a new policy uh, the Home Office has since October, sorry, since September, called requesting a second opinion for a medical report, medical legal report. And this provides that all external medical reports requiring consideration of the adult at risk policy received while a person is detained must be referred for a second opinion. So every single time one of your detained clients uh, is the subject of a medical report, the Home Office have a policy of getting another one before they can consider it. So it always applies unless the decision has been made to release or removal is set for 10 working days. So unless they've already decided before they get the report to release you, or removal is in the next 10 days, or they're going to reject the report anyway, they will get a second opinion. Um, their timescale provides that it will be referred for a second opinion within one day. You'll get a chance to respond. Uh, and then an appointment will take place within seven working days of referral. And it'll be five further working days. So you're talking about the guts is three weeks uh, before the report is prepared. And then normal casework should consider continue until that's considered. And there'll be no change to the adult at risk level. Um, there are serious problems with this report, in, in, with this uh, policy. The policy suggests that you can turn down the opportunity to have a, a, an assessment, but I think it's hard to believe that that won't seriously prejudice the weight that they place on your uh, on your report. So I think it's a, it's a major problem, and in my uh, view, clearly unlawful. Napier and Penali, there are numerous ongoing civil claims following Napier and Penali uh, um, accommodation scandal from last year, and uh, the case of NB and others. Many in Napier barracks were in de facto detention in January 2021. The way that worked was uh, the Home Office announced the fact, well, people, there was no official decision to detain anyone, but they locked all the doors on the basis that there were uh, um, coronavirus cases inside the camp and that all 400 people inside it were said to be close contacts. And that continued for about two weeks. Many of both camps were also subject to legal curfews. Uh, the, court, the county court is aggressively case managing these claims. Uh, if you have one of these claims, 
please do get in contact because there's a CCMC, uh, well, a CMC on the 17th of April 2023 to identify a lead case, and it'll be really important for uh, solicitors to uh, cooperate on those. So bite-sized issues, just a couple of minor points before I pass over to Eva. One is um, offender management casework guidance. That's a, a recent uh, change and it updates the adult at risk guidance to include information about the management of individuals who suffer from serious health conditions, um, uh, which requires specialist treatment or medication. Um, so I think that may be following Raza Halim's case last year on, uh, on HIV. Um, and then uh, the de detention case progression panels, they've introduced independent panel members, uh, which is, I think, a really good idea. And I've seen real progress being made in detention cases from uh, the actions of case progression panels, although, of course, they're a little bit hit and miss. OK, that's all I was going to cover for now. I'm going to pass on to Eva to start looking at cases um, and quantum. And I hope her Internet is a little better than mine. Thanks very much, Greg. OK, I'm going to um, continue. Greg has um, covered his top five cases um, in quite some detail, and I'll now um, follow or start my presentation with a slight whistle-stop tour of some of the other very important cases that have come out of 2022. Now, starting with the case of BVN, this was a trafficking case in the admin course um, where the claimant had been released from bail um, following an order by the admin court. Um, and the admin court had made release subject um, only to a single condition of residence. And following that, the Secretary of State um, then imposed a further condition of reporting. Now, in that case, the admin court then held that that was um, impermissible because um, the admin court had granted um, bail on a single condition and therefore the Secretary of State had no power to impose any additional conditions. Now the second case is the case of Nyangui and this is also another um, interesting and rare habeas corpus um, case. So this is a non-immigration related case, really. It's a criminal law case. And in that case, the claimant had been um, acquitted in the magistrate's court um, late on a Friday night. And despite the acquittal, um, the person continued to be held um, in custody. Now, both the legal representatives and also the court um, tried to intervene quite heavily um, and regardless of that, um, detention continued. And the court in that case um, made recommendations in the judgment that um, further instructions and policies issued to really explain um, to prison staff um, what their powers of incarceration were. Third case then is the case of um, Ali. This is a detained fast track case. Um, and it's a very interesting case because it is a successful appeal in the High Court of a decision in the County Court in relation to unlawful detention. Mm, yeah, and just to note uh, that an appeal against the decision in the County Court lays to the High Court instead of to the Court of Appeal. And um, that case really is a very helpful and rare example of how the appellate jurisdiction um, works from the county court. The next case then is the case of PZX. And this is a, a very helpful case on costs in interim relief proceedings and um, when costs may be awarded as assessed on an indemnity basis. Now, indemnity costs generally, of course, um, are only appropriate where the conduct of um, the paying party has been unreasonable, and not only generally unreasonable, but unreasonable to a high degree. And um, the judgment uh, really quite helpfully rehearses the principles um, on costs being assessed on an indemnity basis at paragraph 13. And in this case, the failings by the Secretary of State um, were delays in providing accommodation, which led to a very vulnerable person, and I believe um, potential victim of torture 
um, to be detained for many, many months, even though the Secretary of State ha had accepted um, that the person should have been released. And then there was also unreasonable conduct in the way in which the proceedings were conducted and um, delays in that, um, that meant that costs should be assessed on an indemnity basis. And then last but not least, the case of MH. This uh, relates to a Dublin three removal challenge. So we'll probably not see many more of such cases, um, but really it was, the whole appeal was against dismissal of a JR claim where um, this had actually become academic because the Secretary of State had since uh, then, or since the permission refusal, or since the dismissal of the JR had withdrawn the third country certificate in this um, case. And so the only reason why this matter reached the Court of Appeal um, was because the outcome of the appeal may have had um, an impact on costs and an application for statutory charge. Now, in this case, the Court of Appeal held that um, these were really insufficient reasons um, for the Court of Appeal to investigate um, the underlying merits of the appeal and um, gave guidance or provided some guidance and said in these circumstances, the Court of Appeal would only intervene where the judge below was obviously wrong, which they found in this case was not the case. Now then moving on to speaking a bit about quantum, I'm just mindful of the time. I'm going to try and finish so that, that we have about um, five to 10 minutes for questions at the end. So do post your questions in the Q&A so that Greg can already have a look at it while I'm speaking. Okay, so speaking about quantum, um, as Greg said, I'm gonna start with some very general um, principles uh, and I'm sure most of you will be um, aware of them and this will be old news. So very briefly, uh, general principles, um, of course, that there's no requirement that the defendant must have foreseen any harm that was caused, but um, uh, they must bear the responsibility for any loss caused um, in any event. Damages also must be assessed um, in the round. And so it's, uh, it can't just be, or it can also not just be by way of a fixed daily tariff. And that's why it's so difficult to determine um, the level of damage and so important to determine the level of damage in individual cases. Now, thirdly, by way of general principle, is really that the initial shock of being detained um, will attract the greatest awards in terms of daily awards. So it's quite important um, for you in every case to um, really assess whether there has been such an initial shock. So, for example, where you start with a lawful period of detention, which then gradually <clears throat> becomes unlawful <laughs> or becomes unlawful at some point, rather than um, detention being unlawful from the outset, so from the start of the detention, yeah, that will make a difference for your damages claim. And also um, the rate at which damages um, are assessed will decrease over time. So a person will essentially receive more um, initially uh, and then the, the daily rate um, will gradually decrease. Now, in practice, it's really important when assessing quantum of a claim to assess the length of the unlawful detention, and then also the circumstances and the impact that the detention has had on your client. So that's why it's important um, that sometimes you'll, you'll require, or that often you'll require evidence, um, and that can be expert evidence and um, witness evidence, or definitely witness evidence, sometimes expert evidence, depending on the issue. Now, a brief note on substantial um, versus nominal damages. Causation is key for more than nominal damages to be awarded, so you have to be able to show that um, the public law error um, actually caused the damages because otherwise your client will only get nominal damages. An example of nominal, nominal damages 
is the case of ZA Pakistan. Now, a key tool to arrive at a reasonable figure for um, quantum or damages, it's important to compare your case to awards of damages in earlier decided cases. But what's really important to do is um, that you calculate the historic awards um, in such a way that you increase it to reflect um, inflation and you also increase it to reflect a 10%, the 10% Simmons and Castle uplift. Now, the top tip really is to use um, Lawtel on Westlaw <laughs> because that calculates everything for you. So there's, um, there's really a very, very helpful tool and also very easy to access. Yeah, once you click on um, Lawtel within Westlaw, then you only have to um, do two more steps, which is uh, select the personal injury topic page and then um, the practice tools. And then you'll already see the calculator coming up. And I've just taken a screenshot of it just to show you um, an example of it. So this is um, also just to show you the stark difference between um, historic of awards and then awards how they would be today. So this is the case of Thompson, where the damages award was um, £3,000 for the first 24 hours, of course, very seminal case. Um, the date of the judgment was February 1997. So I've inputted this here. You don't apply the Helen Rankin uplift because it doesn't, it's, it's not usually applicable. Um, but you do apply the Simmons and Castle uplift and it then provides you with the current value and the current value is significantly higher. So for the first 24 hours today, it will be 7,583,061. So very important that you do that. Now, reported cases, um, again, I'm mindful of time, so I don't want to spend very um, long on seminal cases because you'll probably um, be aware of them already. But the, one of the most important cases is, of course, um, the case of Thompson that I was just um, speaking about. And here, the court set out the guidelines for basic and aggravated damages and said that um, really for the first hour, a person at that time um, would have received or should have received 500 um, pounds and then 3,000 pounds for the first 24 hours. Now, what I've, I've done on these slides, just to make it a bit more helpful, is already calculate today's figure. So if you want to use this as a guide, it's only really applicable today. Um, or around now, but then you'll have um, the latest figures there. The next case is the case of MK Algeria. This um, regarded an Algerian national who'd been issued with a residence document as the husband of an EA national. They were detained for about three weeks um, and on appeal, so this is a court of appeal case, and on appeal, the um, awards increased the basic award increase from 8,500 to then 12,500 in basic damages. And this is also a case where aggravated damages were awarded. In the case of Musse, this was a Somali national who had a Dutch passport and who was wrongly detained pending consideration of um, his deportation by the Secretary of State. Um, there are no specific vulnerabilities in this case or, and there was prior experience of custody, so there was no initial shock to going back um, to the general principles I set out earlier. Um, but this is an example of where there was a particularly high award, including both aggravated and exemplary damages. Now, the next case, seminal case, um, that is, again, is the case of B. This uh, regards a torture victim um, who was detained for a six-month period. Um, and again, this was a case where both um, basic and aggravated damages were awarded. Um, and the aggravated damages were merited 
by the Secretary of State maintaining an unjustified defense and also um, failing to exercise due diligence in regards um, to their own detention rules and policy. Now, the last case on, on the list is um, NAB, NAB. Um, this is a very important case um, to bear in mind where detainees don't cooperate with removal, and that was um, held to be relevant to the level of damages awarded in this case. Again, there was no first shock of detention um, and, and also no real um, mental health impacts. The daily rate of damages in this case um, was 75 pounds at that time. Um, and the detention was 82 days long. Okay, now quickly moving on to new cases. So rather than only cover it, um, covering 2022, I've also covered 2021, just because there are rarely many new quantum cases. Um, so just to include um, kind of both years. Now, the first case um, was a 2021 case of Reese. Now, um, Reese is a also a non-immigration case um, where the person or the claimant was held on remand for a very, very long time before charges were later dropped. And in the liability judgment, the court found that there had been malicious, that the prosecution had been malicious, and um, there was also a finding of misfeasance in public office, so very, very serious. And then in the case, there was an appeal against the judgment on quantum. The damages that were um, ultimately awarded were 155,000, and that included a basic awards and aggravated awards and an exemplary award. And the courts um, held in this case, and that is, that is the interesting um, thing about it and the general or, or an application of a general principle, is that interest pursuant to section 35A of the Senior Courts Act should not generally be awarded in false imprisonment claims. So have a look at paragraph 46 of that judgment. Now, the next case is kind of a minor case of Trivet. Um, Here in that case, the Secretary of State failed to consider whether detention was necessary before the claimant was removed from the UK to Romania. The length of the detention was 23 days and the awards, the award of damages was 12,500. The next case um, is the more recent case of Abdul Barker. The liability finding was along the lines that there had been a breach of the third Hardy L. Singh principle. And um, there had also been an unreasonable delay in providing the claimant with accommodation. The length of the detention was 40 days, damages awarded was 17,500. Um, Importantly, the court held um, that in these circumstances, uh, no aggravated and exemplary damages um, should be awarded or, or would be appropriate. Now, the last case is, is quite interesting. <laughs> um, it's the case of Cassie RJ. Um, it's also a non-immigration case where the claimant um, argued, and it was all about Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights, and whether um, the claimant's rights under Article 5 had been breached. And interestingly, the court found against the claimant on liability, but regardless of that, um, went on to consider quantum in case liability had been established. Um, so damages for just satisfaction. And what's interesting at paragraphs or, or helpful for practitioners is that at paragraphs 112 to 117, um, the court set out the principles for human rights breach damages. So that's very helpful. Um, and the court held that in these circumstances, the length of detention was 49 days. Uh, damages 
of only £5,000 should have been awarded and the low amount um, or, or low, the low amount would have been justified because significant weight should have been attached to the claimant's own conduct because the whole detention was triggered um, by the claimant committing further offences on licence. Yes, so I think that was um, everything from my end, and I'm going to hand over back to Greg. Greg, I'll just uh, continue sharing my slides, um, I suppose, because it's just the last one. Thanks, Eva. Um, yeah, I was just going to cover the last slide, which is just about um, things we think are going to come up. <clears throat> I'll get through it quickly because we don't have a lot of time left. So first of all, um, we are coming up to the end of the Hamati period. So the period during which the Home Office's policy um, didn't account for the requirements of European law came to an end with the int introduction of the transfer regulations in uh, St. Patrick, well, 17 March 2017. Um, so we are coming up to the six limit for the six year limit for those next year. So they so we're still at a point where there are simple false imprisonment claims left out there somewhere, I suspect. Um, it is worth noting, however, that you can in certain circumstances get an extension of time for somebody who suffered a personal injury as a result um, of their detention, though that may not be that likely in the context of um, someone who was Hamati detained because it tends to be quite short. There will be civil claims coming out of Manston. Um, if you look at what we heard in um, uh, earlier on, you had literally thousands of people detained, uh, many of whom appear to have been detained longer than was lawful and in circumstances that were unlawful, so there will be civil claims rising out of that. Similarly, Napier and Penali, there are probably a lot of claims out there that haven't been brought yet. Some of the people who were, um, <clears throat> who were accommodated Napier and Penali and ultimately detained some of them will have been detained in circumstances where it was totally inappropriate for them and they suffered significantly. I've seen some uh, medical evidence in relation to some of those really vulnerable people um, where it seems that they were quite badly affected by the way they were treated. There are going to be a lot of challenges to the electronic monitoring policy. Um, I know Jed is on the call. He uh, was doing a case with uh, David Kiriko. I was doing one with Colin Gregory. In fact, we were supposed to be in court this week and I challenged to that. And both of our cases settled because uh, we got the tags off um, and we're dealing with damages separately. Well, we are in my case anyway. Um, but there will be challenges. I know Xu Xin has one up and running. And I think Privacy International are involved in that. And I think that's a Bat Murphy case as well. Um, I have had a text message from Jed. This is quite an interactive um, talk we're having here. Uh, and Jed has let me know that in respect to the second opinions policy I talked about earlier, he's got a challenge up and running on that um, with medical justice at the moment, which should be really interesting to follow. We haven't had a judgment in Rwanda yet, and we have to see what follows out of that. We may see an increase in detention uh, arising out of that, so we'll have to, that's something we need to keep an eye out for. Um, in the context of the unwillingness to provide more money for adequate accommodation, we are going to see further um, issues with accommodation. We're going to see people who are continuing to be detained in circumstances where they don't need to be. Um, and I think we'll continue to see a lot of um, detention cases that are ultimately at their core, I think, um, austerity cases. Uh, that's been the pattern for a long time. And I think that will remain. That, I think, is all I wanted to cover. Um, I have answered a bunch of questions. Um, I think uh, just following on from, I, I've answered a bunch in the chat. If there's anybody who didn't like their answer, or wants more detail, um, please feel free to let us know. We've got another three or four minutes, um, but I think what we tried to do was cover all of the stuff that uh, you kind of need to know or was, would be really useful to know uh, without giving too much kind of swamping in detail, but obviously I'm happy to give more detail on anything um, as and when it would help. Okay, well, it looks like we've covered everything and we've got a few extra minutes left for uh, a vital uh, lunchtime sandwich. So I'd just like to say thank you very much uh, to Eva for a great presentation and thank you very much for all coming along in your lunch hour. Um, I hope it's been useful. Uh, it's certainly been useful for me to read through all this stuff again. Um, and I'll see you all soon.